morning, everyone. And uh, good morning to those of you who are in the, the creche and also those who are in the hall next door. Thank you for coming. And we trust that you know God's presence and his blessing as we worship together this morning. Uh, our speaker this morning is Andrew Thompson. Uh, he was here during the vacancy and helped us there. And uh, we're pleased to have him back with us again this morning. Uh, so we're going to sing our first hymn, which is Come People of the Risen King who delight to bring him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. We remain seated uh, as we sing. So let's just uh, come now before the Lord in prayer and uh, commit our service to him. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for those words, rejoice. Father, we thank you that we have, want, have something to rejoice in. We have one who makes our hearts glad, and that's our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank and praise you for all that he is and all that he means to each one of us. Father, we thank you that we are here this morning 
Thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. The hope, Lord, of an eternity spent in your presence, enjoying your glory and your wonder and your beauty. Father, we thank you that we have a priest there who is interceding for us at the right hand of Christ. We thank you there for the work that Christ does on our behalf. We thank you that even now, Lord, he's bearing our prayers before you into that holy place. Father, uh, as we come before you this morning, Lord, uh, there are many things on our minds and on our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you'll help us to uh, still those thoughts and to focus our thoughts on you this morning as we meet around your word. Father, bless uh, our brother Andrew who's come amongst us. May he know the presence of the Lord here uh, along with us, Lord, and may he know the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through him as he opens up your word, as he speaks to the boys and girls, as he speaks to the rest of us. Lord, may it be a message from yourself and one, Lord, that will be a blessing to us and help us to be more Christ-like in our lives and in our service for you. Father, we pray for those uh, of our fellowship who have been recently bereaved. Father, their hearts are sore and aching, and yet, Lord, we know that they have that hope of seeing their loved ones once again uh, in the glory. So, Father, bless them. Comfort those who are mourning. Lord, there are those in our midst who are struggling, or those, Lord, some who can't make it here, struggling because of old age or sickness. We pray for them, Lord, that they too might know your blessing. And for anyone, Lord, who's listening uh, to this on YouTube or on a CD in the future days, may they too, Lord, be blessed by it. Father, we thank you for Carol being with us here this morning. Thank you for the way you've uh, restored her. Lord, there's a long way to go, but we thank you that she's able to be here this morning and uh, for answering our prayers concerning that. Father, we thank you for the young children who've been here this morning, uh, many of them already in Sunday school and Bible class. We thank you for each one of those lives we uh, ask Lord that the things that they hear and the things that they learn concerning Christ will cause them to spend their lives seeking to please you and serve you and bring honour to your name. So Father, again we just commit our time here this morning. Father bless the pastor as he has his uh, a break, a chance to rest and recuperate. Lord, wherever he's worshipping, Lord, draw near to him and minister to him as well. So thank you, Father, that we're found here in your house this day. Uh, just continue with us, Lord, and bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's over to you now, Andrew. Thank you for coming. Uh, may you too know God's blessing. Well, uh, good morning. It's good to be with you. Um, boys and girls, I have been asked to do a children's talk, so I've got a couple of things in my, uh, my green bag um, that I just want to share with you. So a couple of these things, I've got something in my pocket as well, but a couple of these things, one I use in work, and two of them I use at home, okay? And let me show you the one I, I use in work sometimes. Not very much, but sometimes I have to use it. And... Let's see if anybody can figure out what it's called. I can get it out here. Anybody know what this is? Boys and girls, I fear a few old people answer and you know what it is rightly. Yeah? A stethoscope, very good. Anybody know what a stethoscope is for? Well, it's used for listening to different parts of the body, but you pop it, I'm not going to do it because it'll probably catch on this and pull it off, but you pop it into your ears and then you can use this little end here uh, to listen to different parts of the body, okay? Uh, some people use it to listen to your heart and place it in different little places in your chest and listen to your heart, but some people use it to listen to your lungs at the front of your chest or on your back, but 
In my job, we use it sometimes to listen to people's tummies, okay? And that's the easiest place probably to use it, which is good. And, and what we listen for is actually to hear if the tummy is making any noises. If the tummy's making no noises, then sometimes we're in trouble. But what I want to hear is a couple of little gargles or little noises. And what happens actually in church, it always happens in church, is if I stop talking and it goes really quiet, somebody's tummy will rumble. So if we all went quiet for a minute, and there's a couple of you maybe panicking, don't worry, I'll not go, I'll not go too quiet. But really this is used to, to find out if there's a problem maybe in your heart or in your lungs or in your tummy. Very often, whenever I'm using this, it reminds me of, of the Bible, because the Bible helps us to understand where we have a problem, where we have gone wrong, where there's something not right. And of course, the Bible doesn't really talk about our lungs or our tummies or our hearts being the main problem, but it talks to us about our sin and how we're, we're, we're sinful people and we do things that are wrong and that displeases God and, and separates us from God. And so the stethoscope is really, really important in life, not maybe as important as the Bible. The Bible is the most important tool that we have to find out what's wrong, but also the Bible tells us how to make that right, it tells us how we can have our sin forgiven, it tells us how um, our problem of sin can be dealt with and fixed through Jesus. And so it's very important to use this to listen, to hear what the problem is. Now, the second thing I have with me, um, again, I don't use this very much at the, mom at the moment either, but I have a, a little set of, of headphones, okay? And these connect to my phone, and maybe I would go out for a run or go out and, and use the gym, and I would put these headphones on because they kind of encourage me to keep going, okay? And sometimes if I'm out for a run, I don't know which one I need the most, <laughs> whether it's the headphones or the stethoscope, <laughs> questionable. Um, but they really sort of, you know, you get tired and you think, I can't go any further, or I can't do any more. And if you're listening to a bit of music sometimes, they just encourage you to go that little bit further um, or to, to do that little bit more exercise, okay? And again, very much like God's Word. Listening to God's Word, even as Christians, hearing what God has to say to us really encourages us to keep going. Sometimes we struggle. Sometimes our lives turn upside down. Sometimes things don't go right. Sometimes we struggle in our minds. Sometimes we struggle with our bodies. It's really important to keep listening to what God says through His Word to encourage you to stay strong, to keep trusting in Him, and to keep living for Him. Now, the last thing I have, and I use these every, I was going to say every day, but I use them every night. Now, let me get them out here. Now, boys and girls, you're in church, so you can't tell any lies here. Anybody have a mum or dad that snores? <laughs> Hands up straight away. Huh? Yeah? Husbands and wives can partake as well. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's a whole load of hands up in the back hall. We can't see you, but you can all have a laugh at each other too. Well, I use these every single night. Earplugs. And they do the opposite. These things you can hear with. Earplugs do the opposite. And you know why I wear earplugs? Because I snore. And sometimes I wake myself up. <laughs> I snore so bad I wake myself up and I really struggle to sleep if I don't have earplugs in I hear everything I can hear the fridge buzzing downstairs I can hear the oil tank I can hear everything and so I have to wear earplugs and whenever I put these in I can snore away as happy as now I can't hear anything and I can snore all night these earplugs do the opposite, don't they? You put them in, it means you can't hear anything. And boys and girls, that would be the wrong thing to do with God's Word. That would be the wrong thing to do with what God has to say into your life. And yet, we live in a world where maybe in school or maybe at university or wherever you are or with your friends, people might say, you don't need to listen to the Bible. You don't need to listen to God's Word. It's old. It's hard to understand. And so, there's no point really listening to it. 
are listening to God. And I want to encourage you, boys and girls, to keep listening to what God has to say. To read His Word, sometimes it's hard to understand, but go somewhere that helps you understand it, like church or Sunday school or a children's club. Maybe you listen to things in the world that are different to what you hear in church. Maybe you hear people talking about that there is no God or that the world just exploded or the universe exploded at the start of time and the world just came into being. That would be a time to put the earplugs in because that's wrong. Maybe you listen to people talk about how you should look. Maybe you're worried about what your hair looks like or what weight you are or what your face looks like or what your teeth look like. And sometimes the world would make us think that those are the most important things. Well, I would encourage you to listen to God's Word because actually what God says is what's on the inside is the most important. What's going on in your heart, what's going on in your soul is the most important. And the most important thing is that you listen to what God's Word says about you, about your life, about your future, and about your value. So I trust that as we've thought about these things, if you ever see somebody with a stethoscope or with earphones in or with earplugs in, you'll just remember some of the wee simple things that I've shared with you this morning. And you'll remember to listen more to God and His Word, to follow that and to live for that. Now, I think with a children's song we're going to sing. Paul ran away with him, thank you. Yes, one way God said to get to heaven. So let's sing together, and I think we're sitting to sing again. Let's turn in God's Word to uh, Psalm 2, please. Psalm 2, and we'll just read through the whole psalm and share a few thoughts just for our time together in, in God's Word. Psalm 2. This is God's Word. Why do the heathen rage and people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. 
Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Let me just pray again as we come to read, uh, think through what we've read. Father, we still our hearts, we confess, Father, that our sins are many, but we thank you that your mercy is more. And Father, as we come to your word, we pray for that fresh cleansing of sin, that fresh filling of your spirit, that our souls might be in tune in line with the spirit of God, that we might hear what your word says to our hearts. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I don't know if you've ever watched the film 1917, uh, released in the last couple of years. And the film is quite different than, than other films in that it really just tracks two young soldiers in the First World War. And these two young soldiers have a mission to go and warn elsewhere about an impending attack. And so they set off over the bunker and make their way through the barbed wire into enemy territory. And the film constantly focuses on them. There's no other scenes. They're on the screen the whole time. There's no over here and then over there. They're constantly in shot. And the film is quite, quite good because it really draws you in. And we watched it in the living room on the TV with a sound bar. And in the back corner of the living room, we have a Bluetooth speaker that really focuses all the bass sound. And as the film progressed and shells were going off and guns were being fired and these guys were under attack through their mission, I started to get really, really invested in the film. And I became so invested in the film, so drawn into it, as the bombs were going off and my big speaker in the corner of the living room was blasting, I actually had to laugh at myself because I nearly was checking around the walls to make sure they were okay. I got so sucked into the film and so immersed in the film, I felt it was there. And I actually sort of laughed at myself because I thought, here, I'm okay. I'm in my living room. I'm on my sofa. The fire's lit. All is well. The walls are okay. And that's actually kind of the, the theme of Psalm 2. The heathen are raging. The world is on fire. The wickedness of the world is, is so strong, it would almost make you think that the world is going to crumble, that God is not in control, that we are in danger, that God is, is lost in the, in the midst and the noise of a powerful world that has risen up against him. Psalm 1 and 2 are kind of meant to be seen as entry pillars, two pillars as an entry into this great hall of songs. It's important to mention about the Psalms that they're not really to be read just as individual suites. That's the way we can read the Psalms. I like this Psalm and I like that Psalm and that's okay but they're not actually individual suites wrapped up like Quality Street. The book of Psalms is really to be seen like a dessert, one whole piece of work. And if you follow the flow of the Psalms, that's a book um, written, the flow of the Psalms, if you're interested, go and buy it. But the flow of the Psalms largely go from lament and sadness, and they finish up really focusing on rejoicing and praise. And that is the gospel, isn't it? We're broken in sadness. We're lost. But when we're saved and when we trust in the, the power of the gospel, when we trust in Christ, we, we go through this life and we end up in praise and worship. And so there's more psalms at the start that are to do with sadness and brokenness. And there are more psalms at the end, largely, that are to do with praise. 
And so the whole flow of the Psalms, seen it as a, as a dessert, go from brokenness to praise and worship. So what about these two opening Psalms? How are they the pillars that bring us into the book? What sort of theme do they set for us? Well, if you know Psalm 1, and most people know Psalm 1 pretty well, about the blessed man who lives a perfect life, who doesn't get involved in sin, who delights in the law of the Lord, and then it compares it with the godless man or the ungodly man who is judged for his sin. And really, Psalm 1 is introducing us to the character of the law. But Psalm 2 introduces us to the person of the Son. And again, that is the gospel. We are faced with the law of God. We fail to meet it. We're broken in sin. And we need the Son to come and save us. So, as we focus on Psalm 2, we need to focus on the Son. And that's how the Psalm ends. When I was living at home, I remember one Saturday morning having a lie in, and uh, as teenagers do, and uh, I think I got up for my dinners, <laughs> which is teenagers do. Um, I remember mum coming in to get me up, and uh, she told me the story after, because I don't really remember, but she came in to, to sort of <coughs> call me to come downstairs and do whatever I had to do. And in my sleep, in my kind of semi-conscious state, in a quite an angry tone, I, with my eyes closed, holding on to my duvet, I said, who's in charge here? <laughs> Not realizing it said it, just nodded off again. And it's only when I come downstairs, mom told me that that's what I said. And that's the question in the book of Psalms. That's the question right through scripture, but it's really the question in Psalm 2, who's in charge? We're used to people being in charge. We're used to parents being in charge. And then we get free of that, and then we go to work, and then we have a boss who's in charge. And right through life, we're used to people being in charge. And Psalm 2 really asks this question, who is in charge? So I've got four points that I want to share that naturally break up through, the, through this uh, Psalm 2. So from verse 1 to 3, here's what I want to share with you. Don't be surprised. The world has always hated God. Don't be surprised. The world has always hated God. And from verse 1 to 3, you'll see the psalmist asking this question. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the ungodly people rage? Why do they lift up their voices and their hatred towards God? Why do they imagine a vain thing? Why do they think so much about living life without God, about dethroning God, about living life on their own. And the psalmist struggles to understand, literally, why do they do this? Why do people rage against God? Why do people want to live their life without Him? Why is the psalmist confused about that? probably a couple of reasons. First of all, the psalmist understands God to be a good God. And so, he can't understand why people want to live without Him, because He's good. But secondly, why would want people want to rage against God? Because He is powerful. He cannot be defeated. He cannot be torn from His throne. So, it doesn't make sense why would you rage against someone who is good and against someone who is all-powerful? The psalmist doesn't get it. But the psalmist observes in verse 2, the kings and the rulers, they set themselves against him. They take counsel against him. It's not very often in our world that every politician agrees. It's not very often that they all come together and walk out and have their fancy photographs and actually have agreed on everything. But one thing the rulers of this world largely agree on is that they want to be in charge, and they want to have no thought of God being in control. Kings of the earth set themselves. They position themselves. 
the rulers, they take counsel together. They agree against the Lord. You think of the Tower of Babel. God, after the flood, commanded the people, go out and populate the world. Go out and start families. Go out and build towns and cities and, and, and build structures and society and, and spread throughout the world. But what did people counsel together? No, we're not going to do that. We're all going to clump together and we're going to reach heaven by building our own tower. And that is still the heart of the world today. Who do they take counsel against? The Lord's anointed, probably first and foremost against the person of Christ, but probably also the people of God, all of God's kingdom, His Son, His people, the great weight of the world's thought is against the Lord and against His people. And verse 3 really brings us to a sum because the, the, what the world says is, let us break their bands. This is what the world sees God's word as. This is what the world sees God as. They see him as a God who has chained them, who limits them. They see God's word as bondage. They see the Bible's standard as bondage. People don't want to be challenged by God's standards. They don't want to be faced with God's word. People don't want to be told that's wrong. We live in a world today, school, university, the workplace, where right and wrong are, are, are muddied. I work with a colleague who, uh, in our staff room, we have these conversations from time to time. I work with a colleague whose mantra is, each to their own, each to their own. I don't mind whatever way people live, each to their own. Now, in our tea room that particular day, we had all gone to the canteen, just down in White Abbey Hospital. And this particular colleague had chips and chicken goujons. And I was very close to doing it, but I just thought about it. What if I went over and took one of her chicken goujons? There's a great risk I could do that. What would her reply be? You can't do that. That's my goujon. I paid for that. That's my lunch. I need to eat that. And what would my reply be? Each to their own. All my goujons are done, and I'm still hungry, so I'm going to just have one of yours. Each to their own. You see, it doesn't work. And within her response would have actually been the law of God that you shouldn't take what isn't yours. But she just wouldn't have known it. I'm making myself hungry now. We'll move on from that illustration. You see, what the world says is that God's word, the Bible and all of its do's and don'ts, really bring bondage, really bring uh, a sense of imprisonment, a sense of, of being held back. When actually the beauty of the Bible, when you follow what it says, when you live by its standards, is that it brings freedom. It helps us avoid so much pain. It helps us avoid so many things in life that are ruining families, ruining lives, all because they seen God's word and its principles as bondage. The essence of sin is rebellion against divine authority. Secondly, don't be alarmed. The Lord laughs at their bluster. That's what it is, bluster. When the world rises up against God, it's nothing but bluster. Empty words, powerless words. His, his, the response in verse 4, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision or confusion or trouble. He who sits. All of the bluster of the world, all of the, the plans, all of the, 
the declarations that the world might make that it's in control, it's not enough to bother God that He would even get off His throne. He sits. He isn't a God who is pacing heaven. He isn't a God who is sitting in panic, worrying about the next claim against Him. We don't have a God this morning who is troubled by new evidence, by things that are found under the ground that would disprove the Bible, anything like that. He sits in the heavens. God does not tremble. He does not hide behind a vast celestial rampart, counting the enemy and calculating whether or not he is sufficient force to counter this new challenge to his kingdom. He does not even rise from where he is sitting. He simply laughs. He holds them in derision. That means he frustrates the plans of the world. He can crush every effort to extinguish his glory from the earth. A Roman emperor, Diocletian, made it his primary objective to wipe the name of Christianity and Christ off the face of the earth. And in a bold statement he had inscribed a couple of times, he declared, I have extinguished Christianity. Well, I think we all know this morning Diocletian is dead and gone. A footnote on the pages of history. And yet the fame and glory of Jesus Christ continues to spread across the face of the earth. People today love him, worship him, and adore him. Diocletian is just in textbooks. And yet the Lord, although he laughs in verse 5, he doesn't laugh passively or inactively. The Lord works amongst those who would be against him. The Lord works amongst those who would seek to topple his kingdom to, to dethrone him, to remove his glory from the earth. He speaks to them in wrath. He vexes or troubles them in his sore displeasure. And despite all the plans, all the resources, all the coming together that the earth might have against God, here's what he says in verse 6, I have set my king upon my holy hill. What does this word set? I have established. He's talking about his covenant kingdom. The fact that he is a covenant-keeping God, that what he says cannot be undone, cannot be unfurled, cannot be taken by surprise. When God sets something, it's set, rock solid, immovable, impenetrable. That is the kingdom of of God. So don't be alarmed. The Lord laughs at their bluster. Verse 7 to 9. Don't be afraid. Jesus rules and reigns. In verse 6, we get this introduction to the king, but then he speaks to the king. This is God speaking to the son. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, this is the Father speaking to the Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I, have I begotten thee, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And I shall break them with a rod of iron, and I shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is the introduction to the kingdom. This is the sort of kingdom that Jesus rules and reigns. This is why we're not to be afraid. He has a more excellent name than all the kings of the earth, than even the angels. And this is a, a glimpse into the kingdom that Jesus rules and reigns. He has a solid covenant kingship. He has a kingship that goes to the uttermost parts of the earth. His kingdom is worldwide. He rules and reigns in the hearts of his people, and his people live for him in all parts of the earth. And this is a call for God's people in the midst of all of the turmoil, in the midst of the heathen raging, 
not to be afraid, but a reminder that Jesus rules and reigns over and above all, that the world would seem to bluster. So how do we respond to this? Maybe you're here as one of God's people, but maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. Maybe you're here, you're not saved, you have no walk with God. You, you maybe go to church, you maybe know the songs, but you have no personal, living, active relationship with Jesus. Well, these verses are largely for you because actually you're not under His kingship, you're not under His rule, you're not under His care or His saving power. You're still under the wicked kingdom of this world, lost. And so verse 10 to 12 goes out to all kings and, and judges and rulers of the world, but it goes out to all people of the world still not in the kingdom of God. Finally, don't be foolish. Trust Jesus. This is the call in verse 10. Be wise now, therefore, kings. Be instructed, judges of the earth. Come and serve the Lord with fear, with trembling. Kiss the Son. Here's the call to go from scheming against the Lord, living for self, to a complete change, to serving under the Lord and living for Him. A call to fear Him and honor Him, but also to rejoice. And that is the beauty of the gospel. We fear the Lord, we, we reverence the Lord, but we're allowed to have joy in the Lord as we serve Him. And this final call to kiss the Son, strange language perhaps for us, but what does it mean? Well, a kiss back then was a sign of, of servitude, a sign of surrender, and a sign of trust. If you kissed someone, it was a welcome, and it was a, an embrace of trust. And so, we are called all people of the earth to kiss the Son, to come to Jesus amidst the rage and anger of the world, there is still a welcome and still a promise of blessing to come and to kiss the Son, to come and seek Jesus, to come and trust Jesus, to come from the kingdom of darkness that this world would rule over, and to step out of that away from sin and to step under the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of light, the kingdom that sets people free. What a pillar, what an entrance into the book of Psalms. And maybe you favorite Psalms that you can relate to and you think about and you go to, and what an entrance these two Psalms are showing us our failure and our brokenness in Psalm 1, and then showing us the Son in Psalm 2. The welcome in a broken world, in a sinful world, maybe of a broken life, but to come to the Son, to go to Him, in trust, to kiss Him, to bow to Him, to serve Him, to love Him. So, don't be surprised the world has always hated God. Don't be alarmed because the Lord laughs at their bluster. Don't be afraid because Jesus rules and reigns. And finally, don't be foolish. Trust Jesus. May God's Word be a blessing to our hearts this morning. We're going to close. Uh, we'll sing and then I'll pray. And our final song together is Oh for a Closer Walk with God.
Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for the reassurance we find in it. That, Lord, when the world seems to be on fire, you're quietly in control. That, Father, when things seem to be crumbling around us, whether on a worldwide scene, Father, but maybe even for some people this morning, their own personal lives seem to be crumbling around them. Their own circumstances, Father, are, are painful, are bringing in thoughts of fear, of worry, of doubt, of all of those, those feelings. Father, we thank you that you're still on the throne. You're, you're a sovereign God. You're in control. Nothing takes you by surprise. And that, Father, all who trust in you, their end is secure. And so, Father, help us to leave this morning encouraged, Lord, that despite all of the noise that we hear, despite all of the, the worries, the fears, the doubts that we might have, despite, Father, governments maybe raising their voices against you, that, Father, it's bluster to you. It is nothing to you. And that, Father, in a moment, you can crush any kingdom in this world. But, Father, your kingdom will go on forever. So, Father, help us as your people, Lord, weak, struggling at times, Lord, to go on living for that kingdom, to seek its building, to seek its, its, its growth throughout this world. We pray these things in the precious and worthy and lovely name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.